I'm Axton. I'm an iOS developer at Rome Creative Limited in Auckland. Uh, just graduated from university. Um, really glad to be here today to talk to you about machine learning and neural networks on iOS and macOS. So the scope of this talk has changed a bit from the uh, the blurb in the in the notebook. Just removing the process of creating a neural network for face recognition, what I was planning, and adding an overview of third-party frameworks that are available for machine learning and on iOS has been added. So that's uh, for you guys. Cool. Yeah, so the goals for this talk are to provide an overview of artificial intelligence, machine learning, neural networks, look at the APIs Apple has provided around machine learning, and cover some of the third-party frameworks that are available out there for iOS. So if we zoom out, what exactly is artificial intelligence? It's the ability to acquire and apply knowledge and skills that are external to natural systems. And the external factor is the machines that we're building. So what is a neural network? Neural networks are processing systems based off the brain's cerebral cortex and its layered neuron archi architecture. This is a diagram of a neural network. An artificial neural network is made up of nodes that take multiple inputs and produce a single output. And they may be used as inputs to other nodes in the network. These nodes are layered in a hierarchy. The input layer nodes may represent individual pixels, for example, in an image or other parameters. And the output layer nodes are often the results of classification from the inner layers. Keep in mind that this is only one way of laying out the neural network, of which there are many, and this is a feed-forward neural network. There are three common types of layers, pooling, convolution, and fully connected. A pooling layer aggregates the data, reducing its size typically by using the maximum or average value of the inputs. A convolution layer transforms an image by applying a convolution matrix to each pixel of an image, for example. So if, it, if you've ever used Pixelmator or Photoshop filters, you'll most likely have used a convolution matrix. A convolution matrix is typically a 3x3 three three or 5x5 five five matrix that is applied to the input image pixels in order to calculate new pixel values in an output image. To get the value of the output pixel, we would multiply the values of the pixels in the original image and calculate an average, for example. A series of convolution and pooling layers can be stringed together to gradually distill a photo into a collection of increasingly higher level features. The neural network's convolution layer uses the convolution matrix to process the input and generate the data for the next layer, for example, to extract new features in an image such as edges which is high contrast difference. A fully connected layer can be thought of as a convolution layer where the filter has the same size as the original image. In other words, you can think of a fully connected layer as a function that assigns weights to individual inputs, averages the result, and gives a single output value. Another concept is training and inference. Each layer needs to be configured with appropriate parameters. For example, the convolution layer needs information about the input and output images, uh, the dimensions, number of channels, and so on, as well as convolution layer parameters, kernel size, matrix size, and so on. The fully connected layer is defined by the input and output vectors, activation function, and weights. To obtain these parameters, the neural network has to be trained. This is done by passing the inputs through the neural network, determining the output, and measuring the error, i.e. how far off the actual result was from the predicted result, and adjusting the weights via backpropagation, passing it back through. Training a neural network may require hundreds and thousands or even millions of examples. So what is machine learning? The field of machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence where a neural network is generated to solve a problem that is otherwise impossible to do with other techniques. It gets us away from writing specific rules for solving problems, which in the end might be impossible. When you try and make such precise rules, 
you end up with a morass of exceptions and caveats as well as special cases. So it sort of seems hopeless. So machine learning techniques can help us approach these problems differently. An example of this is trying to price an apartment here in Melbourne. We can easily write a program that calculates the square meters of an apartment, given the dimensions and shapes of the rooms in it. But calculating the value of the apartment in the market is not something we can put in a formula or switch case. A machine learning system, on the other hand, is well suited for such problems. By supplying known real-world data of previously sold properties to a system, such as and using the market value, size of the house, and other parameters, we can train it to predict future house sales based on the current house's parameters. Another example was handwriting recognition. For example, consider an app that recognizes handwritten letters on a piece of paper. Using the computer science you might have learned in school, you might be tempted to write each of the rules for classifying each character individually. This would consist of extracting pixel data from the image, reading them individually, and creating an extremely complicated mathematical model that relates pixel darkness, position, and probability for each letter individually. And this wouldn't really be feasible. So we can use a neural network instead to come up with a way of class which comes up with a way of classifying letters based on the training data and the image inputs. This is one reason why we've seen real improvement from where we were with beat up Martha, Martin slash eat up Martha of the Newton to the cusp of self-driving cars with autopilot features in Teslas and future cars. So with that at our backs, let's look at the state of current things. There are two general approaches. One is a neural network pre-trained elsewhere on a personal computer or a server and is recreated on iOS for use. This is, a, this is periodically updated and is a device-orientated approach. An example of this would be the new Photos app in iOS 10. The other is a neural network that lives on a server with input and output passed over the network so it will be constantly updated and is a server-orientated approach. An example would be something like Google DeepMind. Let's look at the tools and APIs Apple provides around this area. Firstly is face, rec face detection and core image with CI detector, which can let you know where the left and right eye positions are, mouth position of faces, as well as the tracking ID and the tracking frame count, which core image uses to follow a face in a video. Uh, there's also gameplay kit. So this is mainly for games, but it also provides standard implementations of some algorithms that are vital for the game logic. Speech recognition. This is a new framework that can provide text as well as more information about the recognition than just the text itself. For example, it can also provide alternative interpretations of what the user might have said, confidence levels, and timing information. It can also take input from a file or the microphone. Next is SiriKit. So this is intelligence that accesses your app's functionality using natural language, although this has very narrow domains right now, uh, with messaging, ride booking, photo search, payments, voice over IP calling, workouts, and climate control and radio and CarPlay. Next is Accelerate with BNNS, which is basic neural network subroutines. This is mainly for making neural networks run fast on the CPU. And lastly is Meta Performance Shaders and CNN, which is Convolutional Neural Network. This is similar to BNNS, but uses the GPU, which may require data locality, and therefore you might want to choose BNNS. At the moment, Apple's new machine learning APIs, uh, BNNS and CNN, can be used for building neural networks that only do inference, not, not training. The first new API, part of the Accelerate framework, BNNS, complements BLAS, or BLAS, which is basic linear algebra subroutines, which is used in some existing third-party machine learning applications. 
BNNS defines layers in the BNNS filter class. Accelerate also supports creating, applying, and destroying three different kinds of layers. Convolution layer, with, created with the BNNS filter create convolution layer <laughs> function. Fully connected layers with the BNNS filter create fully connected layer. And a pooling layer with the BNNS filter create pooling layer. BNNS, BNNS activation also provides access to different activation functions for your network. <coughs> Middle performance shaders with CNN is a second neural network API that, was, that is new. While Accelerate is the framework performing fast computation on the CPU, Metal pushes the GPU to its limit. Metal's flavor is the convolutional neural network. MPS comes with a similar set of APIs as BNNS. You can create a convolution layer with uh, MPS CNN convolution descriptor, as well as MPS CNN convolution functions. For a pooling layer, you'd use the pooling max and supply parameters in the function. And a fully connected layer is created using the um, MPS CNN uh, fully connected. Activation functions are defined by subclasses of MPS CNN neuron, neuron linear and subsequent different functions. And as we'll see on the next slide, VNNS and CNN have similar activation functions, but some are missing from either one. And they also have the same respective pooling functions. So let's move on to some third-party uh, frameworks for machine learning on iOS. The first one is Swift AI. This is a fully <coughs> Swift framework. And you can create three-layer feed-forward neural networks with, op with options for customizing multiple things. So you can customize the inputs, uh, whether it's the number of hidden nodes in the hidden layer, uh, the number of outputs, the learning rate, the momentum and the weights, as well as the activation function and the error function. It also has a fast matrix library to let you do matrix operations, and it's available at the link below. I'll put these slides up as well. To use this, you add, you actually add the Swift file to your project. There's no CocoaPod or anything to import as a framework. And if you want to use the matrix functions, use the matrix.swift and the operations.swift <coughs> files. There's also a nice sample application that shows you how these APIs are used on their, on their GitHub. The next one is TensorFlow from Google. It uses a data flow graph instead of a rigid neural network for computation. So data flowing through it is in a tensor rather than a strict matrix. TensorFlow includes a broad spectrum of applications from machine learning research to production systems. So there are a bunch of tutorials out there to use it and a large community creating libraries for it. Adding TensorFlow to your project is a bit of a complicated process. There's quite a few steps to it. And at the link below, there's a detailed um, process to do it. The next one is Swix. This is a Swift matrix library. So it provides operators and helper functions, easy initializers for 1D and 2D arrays, complex math, dot product, matrix inversion, eigenvalues, and some machine learning algorithms, one-dimensional Fourier transforms, and speed optimization using Accelerate and OpenCV. And to use it has a similar process to Swift AI, and it's all detailed on their GitHub. So how can we use machine learning to make great apps? Well, 
difficult, me difficult features might become feasible to add to your app in the time frame that you have. Abstract problems that are not solvable right now by strict rules might be more approachable. And you might be able to apply process improvements to certain parts of your app. Now, I have gone through this a bit fast, but you can follow me on Twitter here if you want, or on my website I will post the slides and speaker notes as well. So I think we're running behind schedule, so hopefully you get early to lunch. But I think we have time for questions as well. So thanks for, to the AUC for having me here, and enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you mentioned, I think, BNNN and CNN. Yeah. Um, what do those acronyms actually stand for and what's the difference between the two? Yeah, so BNNS is Basic Neural Network uh, Subroutines yep. and CNN is Convolutional Neural Network. Yep. So the, the earlier one is more for <coughs> applying CPU-related tasks, so you, if you're not doing any image work or anything like that. And the CNN is more for if you're using graphics APIs and you want to um, find features and images and stuff like that, yep. that's a sort of general What's just a the, thing. Um, common example of the different tasks you would perform with each? Um, I think one would be facial recognition to see what you can pull out of an image to get recognizing objects and different patterns. Yep. But that's, yeah, I haven't had extensive <laughs> um, use of it, so. No, I haven't. Yeah, that's a simple answer. <laughs> yeah. So what's the sort of biggest difference between sort of uh, TensorFlow, which is sort of a data flow type uh, yep. uh, compared to a neural network which is node-based? So what's the, what's the biggest advantage of moving towards TensorFlow in terms of area? I think from what I've seen, it seems more flexible. You can um, do more with it, and it seems to be really pushed by Google and backed <laughs> by a lot of people that have been using it um, for a while, so I think it's a more tested, uh, more battle tested tool. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Which of the frameworks would you say would be the easiest to diagnose um, really useful stuff with that? Like if, if, I, if I was trying to use these algorithms, I'm trying to, like, because, because these things learn and they're, they're rather complex, if I muck something up um, and I go out because I can't, wasn't sure it was particularly correct, which of those would you think would be the most Yep, there's a really cool tutorial on the TensorFlow website, and it takes you through um, recognizing numbers. So they're really low pixel images, and they take you through how to um, use that. And then you can really see if you're doing things right or wrong. But I think starting off with something like Swift AI or Swix will be better than, because it's much simpler than something that's already built up like TensorFlow. Yeah. 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 Um, do you mean that it, we can't actually run uh, or add train examples to it? Yeah, I think you sort of have to already have the training weights and the training data um, from some other place and then implement it using um, Accelerate. Yeah, that's what they mentioned in the talk. Um, Yeah, I think working through some of the TensorFlow examples is quite cool because they have a lot of example apps that, you know, have done, you know, if you want to do image recognition or something, you can sort of see how they've done it. And then if the problem is similar, maybe you might be able to go down a similar route. So I think something that has established examples is quite good to start. So I definitely recommend TensorFlow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was going to ask, how mature Yeah, it seems really young. Like, it's still quite early. Um, I think some of them are. I think, um, 
but the majority I think are still sort of like test sort of projects. Yeah. And I was going to add on like what yep. was the coolest um, example that you you found in your. Uh, I did have a. Uh, Yeah, so this is the Swift AI, Swift AI app. They made like a app that you can just see some of the stuff. And this is a, a routine that approximates a function. So if you play it, this neural network sort of figures out how to follow the same curve. So it's quite cool to watch it adapt to your um, sine wave as you adjust it. So I thought that was a quite a cool demo. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think they're pretty expensive, and um, that's why Apple have tried to provide some of the BNS stuff because it's like trying to make it more performant on a mobile device and stuff. So, yeah, it's pretty intensive. Yep. Yeah. There must be like a threshold where it becomes cheaper to send it to <coughs> the Yeah, I guess so. I guess it's an early lunch. <laughs> cool. Thanks, guys. Cheers.